affected about 20 people, so this is pretty awesome. We are raging in here. Yeah. So, okay, there, we have this thing called the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. You may have read it, you know. But my talk is going to be based upon this small bit of text here, which is cut and pasted from the Fifth Amendment. There's also a, a um, companion provision in the 14th Amendment. Just says, you know, the government's not supposed to take stuff away from you without giving you a chance to, you know, say, hey, hold up. I need to actually know that you're doing it, right? Mostly. Okay, so this is me. Apparently it's not me. So I spent nine, uh, almost nine years in the United States Navy doing electronic um, warfare, sitting in the, or the front seat or the back seat of the EA-6B Prowler, electronic uh, countermeasures aircraft. Um, that uh, black and yellow handle above my head, that's the ejection seat, so that's the, what you don't want to pull on because you go through the glass or you, sometimes the canopy might come off, but you know, don't want to do that. work for Booz Allen Hamilton. I'm a penetration tester and I'm also a law student at um, UDC which is across town. So why you should be skeptical about my talk. So people talk about why they're an expert in the field and I feel like I know a, a, a fair amount about what I'm going to talk about but I also want you to be skeptical. So first of all I'm not a I'm a law student so it means I'm not a lawyer. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll give you an example. Someone, someone came up to me and said, well, I, ha I know about this company and they want to do a joint venture and they're not really sure about the intellectual property, what happens, and, you know, so here's, here's a couple answers I could give. I could go research it and go back to them and say, hey, well, you could do this, this, or this. And then if they relied on that and did something and something went wrong, they'd come back to me and be like, well, he said this. Well, okay, I'm not a lawyer, so I probably shouldn't do option A. Um, option B would be, um, well, I could just, you know, say, hey, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but here's what you should do. Okay, that's probably not a good idea either. So the third option would be, um, well, okay, it depends, which you're going to hear a lot from people who are involved in the law because it, oft it often does depend. But that being said, I feel like I know a fair amount about this topic, so I wanted to present it to you. Um, and the law is not always very clear about what the government or what people can or can't do. Um, it's, it's in flux all the time, especially in areas of law that are novel or new or haven't been interpreted by the courts. So sometimes there isn't a right answer. Um, but I think you should be skeptical about um, what me or anyone else says and, and, and think about it on your, for yourself as well. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about, there's really two parts to this presentation, and the first part's about um, botnet takedowns. Now, many of you are familiar with the technical aspects of botnet takedowns. Um, there's been talks given on how uh, botnets are taken down through sinkholing or through all these various different technical procedures. I want to talk to you about um, the legal aspects, so, uh, because I thought this was very interesting. So what exactly is Microsoft doing to take down botnets. And I'm going to talk about Microsoft. Other people have done this, but Microsoft has, has done it most prominently. So our story begins in 1979. This is, uh, anybody know, know what the logo is? I know, it's, yeah. It's, it's not exactly, you know, something that most people would know, but it's the Louis Vuitton logo. 1979, and as you know, you know, expensive stuff, people make knockoff stuff, right? So Louis Vuitton was having this problem in New York and people were making knockoff and imitation bags and they wanted to do something about it. So they'd go to court and they'd get an injunction or a restraining order and they'd serve it on company A um, and company A would show up in court or maybe they wouldn't show up in court and the, and the judge would say, yeah, you're copying their stuff, you, you know, they, you can go seize their stuff. So Louis Vuitton would get the order from the court and they'd go to company A to seize it and all the stuff would be gone. Like, it's obviously not there anymore. It's like, okay, this isn't working. So, okay, company B. So we'll go after company B. So they haul company B into court. And 
they get a restraining order or, or something like that, and then they go to company B to seize the stuff, and of course, it's all gone. So all these counterfeiters, they all know each other, and as soon as they would get the court order, they would just, hey, you take my stuff for a while, and you know. The problem was the notice that they were being given to show up in court was they were abusing that to take the stuff away. So Louis Vuitton um, went to court um, for what's called an ex parte temporary restraining order. So ex parte means um, the other person doesn't know about it. Um, so they go to court, just, that, just them and the judge, and they say, hey, um, company C is taking or is, is copy or is imitated or, or uh, copying our stuff and they're taking it and they're, and they're hiding it um, when we tell them about it. So we want to be able to go and get their stuff without them even knowing about it. Which, okay, that sounds about right. Except for the fact that, you know, company C, whether or not they're breaking the law or not, has a right to know that they're being sued, right? So in this case, um, the court actually said, okay, it's, you know, because the notice that you're giving them is actually what they're using to hide the stuff, you can have this restraining order um, without them knowing about it. So an ex parte temporary restraining order. So this is sort of the, one of the first novel uses of the temporary restraining order and against, against counterfeit goods uh, and products. So I want to show you a, about 45 seconds of a video, um, if it comes up. Yeah. Oh, we're almost there. Okay. We are in Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, along with uh, the United States Marshal Service. We're about to head to a hosting provider, which is hosting a command and control server for the Zeus family of finance. We're going to go there unannounced, and the reason for this is that we have to do it by surprise. Well, we're ready to go here. Uh, we don't want the individuals that are running the botnet to understand or have any type of, of information that we're coming, because that would guarantee that they would move. Hopefully this action will disrupt not only one, but multiple botnets, and more importantly will allow us to get visibility into the criminal organization which really runs and develops the Zeus family of malware. Okay, so... Uh, I know the audio wasn't very loud, but th this was a video that, Mic that Microsoft did um, uh, against a command and control server in Scranton, Pennsylvania for the Zeus botnet. Um, and this was an example of what we just saw. This was Microsoft going to court, getting an ex parte temporary restraining order against the owner of this uh, facility um, and showing up unannounced. Um, and they typically do have a U.S. Marshal with them, but the, the, the Marshal is just there to make sure that the, the, that the person complies with the law. Not the, it's actually, the, they're, they're, they're along with it, but it's really Microsoft who's going in there and shutting it down. So, you know, you hear this knock at the door and it's Microsoft showing up and you're like, well, that seems a little weird. Yes? Why does Microsoft even have the legal authority to file? Because the court gave it to them. So he's at, the question he's asking is, what are the grounds for filing the complaint? So in this case, uh, the micro, um, and I'll get into it a little bit more later, but Microsoft goes to the court and they basically say, hey, this botnet is harming our customers um, and it's operating from this facility um, and we have to shut it down. So the court says, okay, that's, an, that's good enough. So, and that's, as you can imagine, that's somewhat controversial. So he, I want to talk about, just to give you a little background on some of the primary players, um, the, one of the guys that you saw in the video is the guy on the right, Richard Boscovich, who's, who's Microsoft's uh, Digital Crimes Unit senior, senior attorney. This is sort of his, the legal part of it is his project, and then TJ Campana, who's a uh, program manager at Microsoft, that he's sort of the technical side of it. So um, you'll see all these organizations here working together um, that really to, to pull this off. Um, and what they're using, there's a rule in the, in the federal, rules, uh, federal Rules of Civil Procedure, the rules that um, govern how courts operate. And Rule 65, um, Part B, is actually called an uh, temporary, ex parte temporary restraining order. And this basically says these are the conditions that you have to have to first to do a, a, a temporary restraining order. So a normal temporary restraining order, if you think about it in sort of a, sort of a, a normal context, would be like um, a woman's being abused by her husband, um, she goes to court uh, to, to get a restraining order against her husband to, to 
stay a certain distance away from or something like that. Um, ex parte would be where there's, you know, she goes to the court without him no, even knowing and shows that she's been abused or he's likely to abuse her again and so much so that the court doesn't even need to hear from him and they'll go to his house and kick him out and that sort of thing. So that's sort of the, the criminal, lo, sort of local criminal component to, what, to what's going on here. Um, even Microsoft acknowledges that, that this procedure is an extraordinary remedy, remedy. They say it's constitutionally sus suspect, but of course they're doing it anyway. So as I talk about, I'm going to talk about um, the, bot, the, the six botnets that Microsoft has used this procedure against. And when I do talk about them, I want you to think about these issues in terms of, of the themes as, as they play across. So the, the, ones that are, the ones that are really constitutionally important are the first three. So notice, uh, notice an opportunity to be heard are sort of legal principles. And we talked about due process, and you're, you're allowed due process. These are really core constitutional principles. In other words, if someone's going to sue you, you should know about it, right? You should be able to know, n number one, know about what's going on. And number two, you should be able to show up and say, well, wait a second, they're not right because this. Or even if they are right, you should still be able to show up and defend yourself. Uh, the third one is jurisdiction. So what, you know, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in, in the second half on the, on the, on the uh, domain takedowns, but jurisdiction is the power of the court to do something. In other words, um, you may be a resident of somewhere else, but you're here in D.C. If you get involved in a traffic accident in D.C., for example, that someone could file a lawsuit against you in D.C. court because you have subjected yourself to D.C. So that question is a little bit murkier if you're overseas. Um, what exactly do you need to do to subject yourself to jurisdiction of the U.S. courts? Uh, especially if you run a server overseas and every, you've never been to the United States, you're not directing your traffic to the United States, for example. Uh, the fourth theme is um, the effectiveness. And uh, this doesn't necessarily go to the legality issues, but really, what, are, what is the effectiveness of these takedowns? Are they working? Do they not work? Um, because if they're not working, then all this is, almost all of this sort of goes out the door. Like, if you need this extraordinary legal remedy, and in the end it's not working, then maybe it's not appropriate. Um, next, public relations. Obviously, Microsoft gets a public relations bump every time something, one of these things happens, especially if it's a, spam, um, a botnet for spam, like Walladeck or something like that. Spam goes down, they can put out a big press release, how they took down this botnet, and, and everybody's cheering, and it's a great thing. Um, the next theme would be the impact or crop compromise of investigations. So this isn't a law enforcement investigation. This is a private investigation by a private corporation. Um, and we'll see in one of the examples of the botnet takedown, in fact, the one that you saw in the video here, Microsoft, by doing this, actually disrupted a law enforcement investigation and disrupted some other private investigations by doing this because, of course, nobody knew about it. Um, <coughs> Next is the role of the private actor. So, is, so this is sort of questioning, is it really the responsibility of Microsoft to go after a criminal botnet, or is it really something that law enforcement should be doing? And, and then beyond that, um, what happens when someone who's not Microsoft, who doesn't sort of have this background in doing this, goes to a court who is maybe less experienced in doing this and says, well, hey, I want to shut down this botnet because they're infecting my computer can you, I want to do this, you know, this uh, ex parte temporary restraining order. And that court may, may think it's a novel approach, and they say, well, we want to get in on that too. So what happens when that sort of thing happens? So these are the six um, botnets that, that Microsoft has used this ex parte temporary restraining order procedure against. Um, Walladeck was the first one back in 2010. Um, and you can see... Um, um, the list up here, obviously Zeus is the biggest one, and you, you might question, you know, well, Zeus is still there, right? Yeah, and, and the video that you saw up here was, was uh, one of two command and control servers that were shut down on the Zeus botnet, and Microsoft, you know, because, again, because of publicity and everything, made it look like they, a huge disruption of the Zeus botnet, and really they took down two command and control servers, which is good, but that doesn't necessarily shut down the entire botnet. And Zeus is obviously, you know, live and, and well. 
Yes. So the question she asked was um, under American jurisdiction. So yes, in, in these circumstances, especially in this video and, and all of these, Microsoft is going after command and control servers that are either, that are physically, generally physically located in the United States. So um, the United, uh, Microsoft can't go to a court in the United States and get a court order to shut down a botnet in, you know, Romania or Russia or something like that. Now, they can work with Romania to do that, but this is just sort of the American side of it. But, again, some of these things are happening outside of the United States. So that's, that begs the other question. So this is, this is a, um, I know this is a little difficult to see, but this is a, a chart of global spam volume. And you can see that, you know, in, these are not all Microsoft takedowns, um, but um, there's it's sort of in the middle, right around here, is sort of the Walladeck takedown. So it maybe had a little impact there. And Rustock, which we'll take about, we'll talk about, was over here. It didn't really do much. Um, so you can see that some of the, some of the Microsoft initiated takedowns maybe had some, some effect on, on spam. Um, but, you know, is it, is it enough to go to this extraordinary level? Well, it, just, it turns out that Walladeck, which was Microsoft's first takedown, has sort of come back now. So, and it's actually, um, so initially it was this more or less this innocuous spam botnet, and now it sort of has all this, you know, new stuff written into it. So, Walladeck is back, and it's not clear whether or not Microsoft's, you know, sort of procedures really were worth it because it's there again. I have my phone here because my, I have, my wife has this uh, uncanny ability to either text me or call me during presentations. So uh, she will eventually, so I'll, I'll let you know when that happens. <laughs> now, here's, here's the second button that, that, that Microsoft took down, which, is, which was Rustock. And you can see here that, in this case, they really did, um, where they really were successful in terms of the volume of spam coming out of Rustock botnet. Like, it, it halted. And um, this was the composite blocking list, where I got these charts, actually tracked for like six months afterwards and found out that really, it really did shut down the spam from, from Rustock. Uh, but sometimes then this stuff just migrates to other botnets, so effects. So when we term, talk about it in terms of themes, effectiveness, you know, maybe sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work. So effectiveness of, of Microsoft tactics. So this brings us to the next botnet, which is Kilios. So it's, un, it's, it's unclear whether or not the resurgence of, of Walladeck is... is is another version of Kilios, but Kilios A, which was taken down in um, September of 2011, was sort of repurposed Walladeck code. Someone just added some stuff to it and put it back up. Uh, Microsoft took that down in, in September of 2011 by means of this uh, ex parte temporary restraining order. And a, a few months later, it came back up as part B, or version B, and Microsoft didn't do anything about it then. Um, and then, and then there was a part C, and now as of like three days ago, there's a, there's a D. So you have to ask yourself if this procedure is, is if this is, we need this, proce this emergency procedure, and three months later the botnet comes back up, is it really, is it really, you know, necessary to do? In this case, in this ca in the case of this botnet, it seems like it's, you know, it wasn't very effective at all. Um, the Nitol botnet was, was actually, the uh, Nitol botnet actually started out as an investigation. Microsoft was buying um, counterfeit win computers that had Windows installed on in China, um, and they were counterfeit computers, or counterfeit window versions of Windows, and they just wanted to see, they were trying to investigate where, where these counterfeit versions of Windows were coming from. And as they looked at these computers, they bought uh, 20 or so of them, and they found that three or four of them had this, um, this malware installed on it, like literally as they bought, before they, as they bought it. So it was like pre-installed, supply chain. Someone, uh, someone had actually infected the supply chain and was getting this malware installed on, so people who are just taking them home, had already, they didn't even have to click on anything. Um, so Microsoft actually, this was uh, back in September when 
when uh, they did this spot. And, and, and it appears that this one was very, rather small, like 50,000, 60,000 in terms of numbers of hosts that were infected. Um, and they were able to sh uh, shut this one down. Um, uh, and it turns out that they, they actually did identify the man who owned this do domain, which is 3322.org, and, and, and just reached an agreement with him to give back the domain to him. However, he has to cooperate with Chinese CERT. And Chinese CERT, really? I mean, do you really think Chinese CERT is like effective at doing this? Uh, uh, who knows? So the, the most significant um, uh, the most significant botnet that Microsoft has taken Ash against was Zeus, and this was the one that was in the video. Um, and um, as you can imagine, you know, Microsoft really made it, you know, take down, they made it sound like this was a great thing that they had done, and really they had a very small impact on the Zeus botnet. Um, but beyond that was the fact that um, there were private researchers who were doing research on the Zeus botnet. There were law enforcement investigations going on about the Zeus botnet. And when Microsoft did this procedure, this taking down this command and control servers, um, it disrupted a lot of work that had been going on in the private sector. It disrupted law enforcement investigations. And, 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 and people were loud about it. Uh, this company um, uh, in the Netherlands was like, you really effed up some of the stuff we were doing. Um, so, you know, we want to talk about sort of the, what's the role of the, what's the role of a private actor in doing this sort of thing? Is this something that Microsoft should be doing? Is this something that should be like, you know, do you want to get a whole consortium of businesses? Um, but then again, the more people you tell about it ahead of time, then, you know, maybe people find out about it. So, the last one that I want to talk about, this is very recent. Um, so let's, let's go back and, and, and sort of review what, we've, what Microsoft has done so far. So when they go to get a temporary restraining order, um, typically, even after they shut down the, the command and control server, um, they, these are typically John Doe lawsuits because they don't know who the people are that are actually running them in another country. So the command and control server here in the United States, they're usually the people don't even know what's going on. Um, and then, but there actually might be a known actor or an unknown actor in another country who they don't know who it is. So they'll file John Doe lawsuits and they publish stuff on their website and they say, hey, we're suing the person who runs this botnet, so if you're that person, you should show up in court, and typically they don't. Uh, but sometimes they do, and sometimes they're identified. Um, but, and then often, if they don't show up, Microsoft will go back into court and they'll get what's called a default judgment. And this basically says, um, the other person didn't show up, we gave them an opportunity to defend themselves. They didn't show up, and the court will say, yes, they didn't show up. Um, and the domain, the actual domain, gets turned over to Microsoft. And then this is where you go to, you might type in the domain, and it redirects to, like, Microsoft Internet Safety or something like that. And that's typically what happens. The domain gets handed over to Microsoft. But if you think about it, that doesn't really... That doesn't really shut down the botnet in the sense of all the computers that are out there that are infected are still infected, right? Microsoft isn't doing anything technically or legally to uninfect those computers. So this is, this is a, the Bamatol botnet was actually very interesting in what, this was a, 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 a procedure by Microsoft and Symantec, and what they did was um, they actually used the botnet's um, command and control communications to basically pop up this window in Internet Explorer. I'm sure everyone would just absolutely click on it to say, hey, um, you're infected with this malware. You should do something about it. So the, they're actually using the, the botnet's com uh, communications to warn the user that they're infected with the botnet. So, um, and there's, it's, there's questions about exactly what a private actor can do in those circumstances. Can a private actor, could Microsoft just run some scripts to, to com communicate and uninstall this stuff from someone's computer without their permission? Probably not. And this is really pushing the limits of what, of what a private actor can do in these circumstances. And how many times do you, you know, I, the more, more educated users, you see something pop up like, you have a virus. You know, how many times, you know, that, that you haven't, you didn't run a virus scan or something like this, and you just get a, if I saw this, I would be like, really? So, really, I mean, how effective is this? Um, the second thing that I want to talk about 
are the yes, and there it is. The text, the text message from the wife. The second part that I want to talk about are domain seizures. So you may, you may have read about many of these cases, and I want to talk about four of them um, in particular. So this is slightly different. We're now talking about, instead of a botnet, we're talking about uh, someone runs a domain, a website usually, um, and there's some infringing content on the website. And now the actor is not, um, you know, Microsoft or a private company. Now the actor is some, some arm of the U.S. government. So DHS or, or ICE or in one case that we'll talk about here, the Secret Service. Um, and what this is, is this is the government going to court, um, usually ex parte again, and actually getting a civil seizure order against uh, a domain. So they get an order from the court that says um, this domain is infringing. Uh, the court directs uh, the registrar, usually VeriSign, to redirect the domain to, and, and then you get those nice seizure orders at the website. You know, this domain has been seized, blah, 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 that sort of thing. So that's, what, that's typically what you would see. And again, the themes here are that uh, most of these things are done without any notice. Uh, most times people have no idea what's going on. And I'll talk about one example where um, a domain was seized by the Secret Service. Um, it was eventually given back, you know, a few days later. And they, the, the people who own the domain still have no idea why it was seized in the first place. Uh, jurisdiction. So I, I said I would talk about jurisdiction. So, um, you know, what is the jurisdiction of the United States government or the United States courts over, you know, a server running in a foreign country um, with no connection to the United States other than that they're a .com or a .net or .org? Well, it turns out that because VeriSign is the, the, the top level registrar for .com, .net or .org, if you run a website with one of these extensions anywhere in the world, regardless of where your content is stored, the United States government says it has jurisdiction over your domain. So, mega upload. Servers in another country, although some are in the United States, but uh, defendant in, the other, in another country, New Zealand, servers in Hong Kong, .com or .org is enough. That's, the government says that's enough to subject your website, your, your domain, to jurisdiction of the United States. It's pretty far reaching. Um, Domain seizure themes, effectiveness. So if you, if you take a domain, and we'll see this in an example of, uh, of Roja Directa, uh, you take the domain away from somebody, well, they just get a domain in another country and their website goes back up. So how effective is it really that you're doing? And then public relations. Uh, and this is where the government is really, so in the, in the, in the botnet things, uh, Microsoft is sort of, it's sort of a positive public relations thing for them. Uh, the public relations here is more of a hit for the government because people are sort of get, tend to get outraged when their websites get taken down, especially when they have maybe a very small amount of infringing content or they're unclear what the infringing content is. So the first example I want to use is Mega Upload. It's probably the one that most of you have heard the most of. Um, there's, there's a few. Uh, so for each one of these, um, each one of these, uh, Cases, I want to give you just a few points of where there's sort of legal issues in the, in the, in the, in the situation. So the first, the first deal with mega upload is the federal rules of criminal procedure say that when you charge someone with a crime, you actually have to deliver the, a criminal summons to them. Typically this is mailed, but, but, but sometimes it's given to them in person. It's basically said you're being charged with these crimes. In this case, for example, Kim.com was never actually served with a criminal summons. Um, what they, they were kind of smart in that they didn't have any mailing address in the United States and he's not in the United States. Um, and the government admits that it has never served him a criminal summons. So in the sense of being served with a criminal summons, he hasn't actually been served. And the government's uh, position is that, well, when we, when we extradite him to the United States, then we will serve him. So it's, you know, it's a little bit circular there. But, but the courts have said that's okay. Um, the, second, the second issue with the mega upload is the sort of non-infringing content. So when you go into company C and you, and you, and you seize their sort of fake, um, you know, 
Louis Vuitton bags, you know, you're taking the Louis Vuitton bags. What happens when you seize 25 petabytes of data? And the chances are, I mean, there's probably a lot of infringing content on there, but there's also non-infringing content. So the EFF has been at, at the forefront of, of Kyle Goodwin's case. And Kyle Goodwin is a, a guy who lives in, in Ohio who had used Mega Upload to store, like, he had recorded, like, high school football games, and he's like a video, he does video recording for high school sports, and he was storing all his video on Mega Upload. Well, of course, when the domain got seized, all his stuff's gone, you know, it's his business. So how do you deal with a situation where people have legitimate, uninfringing content, and it gets seized? He, d he doesn't have his stuff back. I mean, how long is, was this is a long time. And the US government just recommend, you know, just delete all the data. 25 petabytes, just delete it. So, obviously, some issues there. Aroha Directa is, is a Spanish website that um, links to streams of sports content, right? So, someone puts up sports content, and, they, and Aroha Directa puts a, a link to it. So, they don't host any of the content themselves. It's sort of like a torrent site in that they don't host the content. They just serve the links. Um, and most of it is actually, um, there's, there, there's a fair amount of, of, of American sports uh, from Roja Director. So if you want to watch American sports, you, whatever. But. Um, so this has been challenged in the Spanish courts. And the Spanish courts have said, you know what, it's, it's okay because they're not actually hosting any of the content. It's an okay website. Um, despite this, the U.S. government um, seized the, their, their domain. domain um, and... This was a very interesting one. So when you seize a domain, you have to, or you seize anything, you have to give the opportunity for the other party to challenge the seizure. Uh, there's certain time periods that you can have in terms of, of how exactly long you can hold it before you can do something. Um, and it turns out in this case that um, the company who owns, owns the domain went to the US government and said, hey, we'd like to challenge that you seized our domain. And the government was like, uh, we don't know anything about it. And then they were like, well, yeah, it was filed under seal, so we can't really tell you anything. Um, and of course, at this point, they just got like a, a different domain and their website went back up. So um, now they're operating under like .me or something like that. But, you know. And this also brings into uh, discussion the sort of extraterritorial application of, 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 of the American law. So sort of general principle of, of, of American law is that American law only applies in the United States unless the statute says, for example, uh, this applies to this situation. So the U I mean, we have treaties and everything for copyright, but specifically U.S. copyright law probably doesn't apply outside the United States, but it may be in certain circumstances. So again, it's, it's not really a question of yes or no. It's like it's really unclear. Um, the US government would like to project its law as far as it can, uh, and typically that's a tension with foreign laws. Yes? How about the fact that many of this is being pushed by the RIA and EAA and not actually being done on the initiative of the government? Right, so he, he's making the point that you know, in, in many of these cases, the the, the government is sort of doing this at the behest of the RRA or the MPAA or other private organizations, industry organizations. So again, and that just complicates it even more. Um, anybody familiar with the JotForm takedown? JotForm? This is, this is one of the sort of, this is the second most egregious one on my list. So JotForm is a website where you can go, it's literally, you create forms. Like you want to do like surveys or forms. Um, and people create forms. And there's literally two or three million different forms on their website. They have like 700,000 customers, um, you know, paying customers. Uh, and it turns out that um, this is a year or so ago, and their domain just got see the completely, like, offline. And they're like, hey, what's going on? And um, somehow they found out that the Secret Service was involved. So they called the Secret Service and said, hey, um, why did you take down our domain? And the Secret Service was like, we don't know anything about it. And then the Secret Service got back to them and said, yeah, it was us. And then so they say, okay, well, tell us, why did you take down our domain? And JotForm sort of had some ideas. Like, they knew that people were creating, like, phishing forms, or they were creating, you know, forms that were, you know, violating the law. And they sort of have a, an, they had an algorithm that would go through their forms and try to figure out all this stuff. So they had a procedure in place to catch 
what they thought was like illegal activity on their site. And it's not known for illegal activity. It's just, you know, as you can imagine, people can create forms. So people were, some people were doing illegal stuff. And they had actually taken down like 70,000 forms in the past, but they say, hey, you're violating our terms. You can't do this. Um, but the entire domain shut down. And these are paying customers in the United States, Canada, over, uh, you know, other places. Um, two or three days later, the Secret Service is like, yeah, sorry about that. They get the domain back. Um, and so JotForm's like, well, can you please tell us why? You know, so we can help our customers understand why you took their stuff away, why, nothing. To this day, they have no idea what specifically prohibited or what precipitated this domain takedown. So they don't know. Um, so, I mean, think about that. I mean, they, they come back the next day and do it again. They have no idea. So that's sort of the second most egregious. And this one, I think, is, is the most egregious. Um, you probably haven't heard of this website. It's not, a, it's not a huge website, but it's a popular website for people who use it. It's a, it's a, a you know, website where people post music and things like that. Not, n typically not um, infringing music. It's where artists publish, put their own music to get it out there. Um, uh, this domain was seized um, by, the, by the government. Um, and it turns out that the infringing content that they claimed was, was, was the reason for the seizure was, was, was music that was actually submitted by the artists themselves. So the artists submitted the music to the website, and then um, somehow that was seen as infringing, um, maybe because the label, the artist maybe didn't have the actual rights to publish it. Um, but then the label went, and then the whole website gets shut down, domain gets shut down. And here's another case where the website goes to court and says, well, we'd like to see the court order. Sorry, that's been sealed. Um, well, they, again, they got an, then uh, the government got an extension on the forfeiture. Uh, and they said, well, we'd like to see the extension order sealed. Sorry, you can't see it. Um, eventually, the government decided they didn't have a case a full year later and returned the domain again. Why? Well, who knows? We're just not going to prosecute the case. A year later. So, and I mean, imagine if this is your business. You run a, a business and it's your website and you, you get all your customers from your website. A year, this, this is akin to, um, you, let's say you run a brick and mortar business or you run a, 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 ma a magazine, you're a publisher. And one day everybody comes in and the government comes in and they seize your printing presses. And think about, think about what the public reaction would be if, if the government came in and seized the printing presses of a publication and a year later said, oh, here you go, we're giving it back to you. I mean, this is really, it's not that far off from that. This is, you're shutting down someone's livelihood for a year. Now you might ask, well, is there a remedy? Can, 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 the, can the owners of the website go and sue the U.S. government? Well, they can. They may or may not have a case, but they, they can try. Yes. So, in many instances, it's it's uh, it's another private uh, group out there that's actually bringing these orders forward. So, if you don't have the right to know who your accuser is, how do you go through the grievance of, of being able to determine that and file counter suits and that sort of thing? So, his question is, if 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 the, if the U.S. government's sort of doing this on the behest of other organizations, how do you even know who to go after? In this case, because, because the action is really being brought by the government, even if it's done in sort of someone else's name, I mean, that's, you go after the government, you know, in terms of, you know. But again, if the government had reasonable suspicion, or not, I don't want to say reasonable suspicion, if the government had some sort of probable cause to believe that, um, that the website was infringing, then going after them, you probably don't have a chance. I mean, they're pro the courts are going to probably say, well, you know, they, they had a reasonable belief that you, that you were committing a crime, um, and as a result, you know, you're not going to get, yeah. Right. Right. Okay. And that and that's really what I want to get into. So, let's talk about the sort of the the sort of the state of where we are now and then going forward. So his question was about you know there. 
is there a place for ex parte temporary restraining orders? Well, clearly there is. There's, there's a case that you can make a case that in some circumstances it is appropriate to be able to go to court and get a restraining order without the other person knowing about it. And this is typically where evidence can be destroyed. The idea of a temporary restraining order is sort of just to pause, you know, take out the remote and pause the situation such that, you know, evidence can't be destroyed, things can't be moved. Um, I think here, and, and that's typically, like I said, that's the remote, that's the pause, uh, but then you're supposed to be able to play at some point, right? So the problem that, the, what I see here typically is that um, the temporary restraining order is being used as a final judgment. So in the case, like I said, Microsoft's going back to court and they're, they're ending the situation, um, you know, 30 days or 60 days later, uh, and the person may or may not ever show up. So my concerns are really, oh, firstly, um, what happens when other companies who, who aren't Microsoft and don't have these high-priced lawyers go into court and want to do this? So one of you may, may um, have uh, software or something that people have on their computer and their computers are infected, so you feel like you want to shut down the ABC botnet, right? So you want to go into court and do this. Could you do that? Well, maybe. Depending upon the circumstances, you might be able to do that. And if you go to, typically, uh, the, Microsoft has typically gone into the Eastern District of Virginia to do this, which is the federal district where they filed the lawsuit. And one of the reasons for that is because these courts, to some extent, have familiarity with this process because they've done it before. Um, but if you go into um, the whatever district of whatever state where they've never handled one of these sort of domain seat or, or one of these um, um, botnet takedown cases, they may be a little bit more unfamiliar with their procedure. So what happens when one of these other companies who doesn't have as much experience goes into a court that doesn't have as much experience and maybe they don't, maybe they, they don't, you know, look for all the same things. The second thing is, you know, we talked a bit in the beginning about how this is an extraordinary remedy. Um, but if you're doing it a lot, the sort of extraordinary becomes ordinary, right? It's just this thing that you're only supposed to do once in a while is becomes what you're doing all the time. And sort of the novel legal arguments become regular legal arguments. And I mean, for, for Microsoft, it's a good thing. Because every time that they get a, when they do the first case and the court says yes and it works out, in the second case, they look back to the first case and they say, hey, we did this before and it worked. And then the third case, they look back and they say the second and the first case and they say it worked. And the more that they do this, the more they're just ingraining the procedure in as, as something that works. And then, you know, the sort of, it, it, it comes down to sort of slippery slope, and this goes back to, to the other two points of when you start, um, when, when this extraordinary thing becomes ordinary, you know, it just, you know, what's the next step? What's the next procedure to use to, to really push the legal envelope? And I know the title of my presentation sort of made it sound like, you know, people were breaking the law. And I want to be clear, that's not really clear, it's not really clear that and Microsoft is, you know, they're really just pushing the boundaries of what the law allows now. Uh, there's no right and wrong in the law, it's whatever the courts will allow. And if they're going to allow it now, then it's, it's you know, by definition, it's legal now. Um, but next time, what happens when the next, when the next, you know, company comes in with a novel argument that hasn't been made? Is, is there some legal mechanism for assigning specific liability in, in the event that one of these restraining orders is issued in error? And, and so the, the right. restraint that's issued against then has specific liability? Right. So the, his question was, what, what, what's, what's in place so that if Microsoft does this and um, and they find out that, hey, the server you shut down was, was not infected with a botnet or something. Typically, not always, but typically uh, Microsoft has to post a bond. So they, and whatever amount of money the court says, $100,000 or something like that. So they'll give Microsoft, will, and this is, this is a good thing. The Microsoft will give the court money in a bond ahead of time such that if there is a problem like that, then that money can be paid out to that party. So, I mean, that, that's a good thing. Um, I think that's all the slides. So I, I think I have some time, and I'll use the rest of the few minutes for questions. Yes, sir. Are 
so his question is, is Microsoft acting as sort of an agent of the court? And oh, so they're authorized by the court as a party, but they're still acting as a private actor. So it's, they typically will have a U.S. Marshal with them, but the U.S. Marshal is there to make sure that the person um, being, is complying with the law. They're not there. It's, this is not a, this is not a, a being served by the U.S. Marshal. They're just tagging along to make sure that, that the procedures are followed. Uh, it's and again, this goes to what's the really the role of the private actor. I mean, it's it's unclear what how how much sort of law enforcement function should be ceded to private actors. Yes, sir. I don't know. I, I, I mean, there, there's there what there there was a case in in Colorado, I think, where a woman was compelled to t put her, not not to turn over her key, but to turn but actually to type the password in to for full disk encryption. Um, that seems to me to to raise some Fifth Amendment issues. Um, but the, in in at least that case, the court said that that she had to provide them. She had to unlock the computer. So, but I don't know in the cir in the circumstances where you're saying where th where the encryption may protect multiple customers, where many of those customers may be. Right, right. So I think the distinction here typically is, um, let's say that you're you're going through customs and you have your computer open and it's on and they see like. Uh, porn, child porn or something, and then you shut down your computer, and they know that there's child porn on your computer. Typically, in that case, they're probably going to be able to uh, get the court to, to give you, to, for, to uh, give up your, you know, f password. However, they have to have, they really have to know that there's something there. Um, but it, it depends. And, and, and every court, it, it's, it's an unclear area of law. It, it really hasn't been decided. So his question is about how, how do you challenge that an order that's being sealed? Um, in, the, in many of these cases, um, the defendants either were never identified, so no one actually challenged them. Um, but it, specifically in the Roja Directa case, they went to the, the government and they tried multiple times to, to get, you know, hey, show us what's at least, but they had no, nothing happened. They, they weren't able to, to, to get anything unsealed. a good question. I mean, I mean, if I worked for Microsoft, I would, I, I, I would keep doing what they're doing. I mean, they're, they're, again, they're, they're, by their own words, constitutionally suspect, but the courts are allowing them to do it. It works for them. It gives them good publicity. Um, and they actually say in their, in their complaints, they actually say that this is, this is necessary. So you have to show that it's sort of ir irreparable damage if we don't get this thing shut down. And they actually make the argument they don't come out directly and say it, but they say our customers are not smart enough to scan their computers for botnets, so we have to do. So we have to be able to do it for them, and they really do, in a roundabout way, say that. And that's one of the reasons that they use in their complaint for irreparable damage is that our customers don't aren't smart enough to figure this out on their own. Are these criminal proceedings or civil proceedings? So these are right. So these are civil proceedings because they're. Even if uh, judgment is found against uh, one of these defendants, they're not going to go to jail. These are, these are absolutely civil proceedings. Um, in many cases, Microsoft it only asks for a nominal amount of damages. They really don't care about the damages in the end. Damages is what a court awards in money at the end of a lawsuit. And they really don't care about the money. They just want, because they know in many cases, the defendant's never going to be found. But, um, they're just they're they're using the temporary restraining order sort of a, as a final judgment, and it's absolutely civil proceedings. So right, right. So um, 
And just to clarify, the, for the example, the domain or the, the, the mega upload thing, that is a criminal proceeding, by the way, because that was done by the government. But all the Microsoft stuff is civil. Um, I don't know of circumstances. I don't, generally speaking, uh, private parties can't bring criminal actions just because of that. Um, but for example, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which many people have talked about uh, this weekend, there is a civil provision in there. So um, not only can the government go after someone for criminal penalties for the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, but Microsoft can allege violations of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in their complaints. And they, in these cases, they do. They do. Yes? For the domain takedowns, um, so the the, depart the DHS program I think is operation in our sites or something like that, and they I believe there's several hundred that they've taken down. Um, and typically they do like the week before the Super Bowl, you'll see them take down a whole bunch of sports websites, um, and they it's you know uh, who knows what they're doing, and they're, usually they're betting websites or things like that, and. A week before, or the day before the Super Bowl, it's probably a little too late to be taking down Super Bowl betting websites, but you know, whatever. Um, but I, it's in the hundreds. It's in the hundreds. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so her, her question was about sort of the legal precedent for corporations being allowed to, to do, sort of given this civil power to do it. And, and you're, you're right, you're right. Two more? Yes, sir. Um, sorry. If Microsoft is the one bringing the complaint, isn't there a conflict of interest if they're also the one exercising the remediation? The courts haven't said so. Yes, sir. Right. So his question is, what the rights of non-U.S. citizens or people outside the United States? Is that what you're saying? That's. <laughs> right. 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 So, so his, his question is a very good one. If you want to subject, and, and let me rephrase it and see if this is appropriate. If you want to subject someone to U.S. law who lives in another country, shouldn't they also be entitled to the rights that we have in our country, right? You want to apply the law to them, then shouldn't our rights also apply to them? And what's that? And, in many cases, I don't think they are. I mean, it's, I, I mean, as we see in, in, um, in Guantanamo, for example, uh, we're detaining people, but we don't want to give them, you know, necessarily all the same rights that prisoners would have in a, in a criminal case. So um, that's a good question, but I don't have the answer. Thank you very much, everybody.